To mark the five-year anniversary of the 311 earthquake, we revisit Fukushima Prefecture in Japan. We learn about how Master Jinyin and Venerable Master Shou-Yi help promote Buddhist practices. Welcome to Da Headlines. I'm Mary Lee Shioda. Thank you for joining us. We begin the program this Monday in Serbia, where city volunteers continued their winter clothes distribution for refugees with special concern for women and children. Among the volunteers is St. Haiti Salkai from Syria, who had participated in this mission to help his own fellow countrymen. In Serbia, city volunteers continue to distribute winter clothes for refugees. Today, they're especially concerned with women and children. <laughs> Volunteer Hedi Suki, who's from Syria, helps drive and distribute supplies. He said that he must take part in this mission to help his fellow countrymen. Suji in Turkey, they were helping making their life more normal. Uh, but here, the, it's much more harder than because they have no shelter, they have no food, they have no, they have no even clothes. In their refugee camps, the children look on with desperation, hoping to have just enough to eat and wear. These refugees have been on harrowing journeys, not knowing how to proceed. They still have to wait for approval from other countries. I think they must feel lonely and helpless. Therefore, I think people in Taiwan are blessed. The children give the volunteers a high five. They may not fully understand why they fled their hometowns, but they know these uncles and aunts in blue uniforms care about them. Sometimes I give them the lollipops I carry with me, and they become very happy. Getting a lollipop can really cheer them up. That makes me happy as well. <laughs> Smiling at a volunteer's camera, the children enjoy a moment of joy. May the refugee children's cheerfulness help them stay upbeat as they face the days ahead. On March 11, 2011, an earthquake of 9.0 magnitude occurred off the coast of northeast Japan, causing a massive tsunami that compromised the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. After the incident, the Japanese government ordered an evacuation of the surrounding 11 towns with evacuation zones of 30 kilometers. Now, five years later, some towns are accessible. However, due to concerns over the safety of the environment, many residents have chosen not to return. The numbers on these scanners represent radiation levels in the air. As the highway enters Fukushima, the numbers start to climb, quickly reaching hazardous levels. Shinichi Ikuda is from Futaba town in Fukushima. As he drives, he points out massive loads of plastic bags full of irradiated material. The mood in the car is somber as he surveys the area. He can't help but think back to that day of March 11th, 2000. An earthquake measuring 9.0 on the Richter scale occurred off Japan's northeast coast. The resulting tsunami badly damaged the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant, causing an explosion which would lead to the complete evacuation of 11 towns within the vicinity of the nuclear plant. Great was not enough to describe the situation. It's completely unimaginable what happened here. Minami Soma City is located about 30 kilometers from the power plant. After five years, the residential restrictions here have been lifted, and the government is actively promoting recovery. However, newly built residences all remain empty. There really isn't anything wrong with the environment, so around 1,500 to 2,000 people will probably return. But even in a decade, we won't be able to reach the previous population numbers. Then there is Futaba, which is only 3.5 kilometers from the plant, where the restrictions have not been lifted. Those hoping to return must receive permission. It feels uncomfortable. I really hate it. All this just to go back to one's own home. Feels like I'm dressed as a thief. It's just to go home. And I still need to have a travel permit to get there. 
This is the last time Mr. Ikuda will be returning to his house. He may never return home, but he will take these photos of his family with him. As Mr. Ikuda snaps photos of each corner of his home, each shot will serve as a keepsake of the home he is leaving behind. Because I may never be able to return. Today is probably the last time. I'll never see my home again. There's nothing to be done. I feel useless. Since he will never be returning, today he leaves some flowers and pays respects to his ancestors. After three years, I finally got the okay to come back. I thought, wonderful. But the current situation isn't so simple. Even to visit my ancestors' graves, I need a permit. And dressed like this, everything is so strange. There used to be over 7,000 residents in this village. Five years later, not even one remains. Only empty playgrounds, piles of irradiated waste, and empty stations. The area is tranquil as Mr. Ikuda says his final goodbye. As earthquakes are a threat to building integrity and safety, in the aftermath of the 921 disaster, the government rolled out a six-year subsidy plan to check on the conditions of older homes. In light of the major tremor earlier this year, more homes will be allotted a grant this year for safety inspection. Taipei City, a modern metropolis that is both a vital political and financial center, Densely populated, the land in which the city sits on is fragile and weak, leaving older homes exposed and vulnerable. Areas that are susceptible to soil liquefaction are, naturally, not suited for structures to be built on so close together. What's regretful is that in Taiwan, with our tiny land and massive population, we have to build on those areas. Experts believe if and when an earthquake greater than 6 in magnitude occurs in Taipei, it would be a nightmare for all the Taiwanese. In the aftermath of the 921 earthquake that struck central Taiwan, over 10,000 homes were damaged. Thus, building codes were greatly modified as a result. Although the new law applies to new construction projects, older structures were exempt. But soon it would be another rude awakening. Looking down from the sky, all one sees is rubble. This is Tainan's Yongkang district, the second section of Yongda Road. Really, not only the Weiguan apartment complex, all of these older buildings, their ability to withstand earthquakes is on the low end. They just don't meet the current standards. The standard seismic design absorbency for structures in the region should have been 320 gal, or being able to withstand a six seismic intensity. Yet the impact of the earthquake in February was less than half of that, and still buildings collapsed. This is our seismic design specification. For example, the Weiguan apartment building was tested to have been at 143 gal. If the building was supposed to withstand a five seismic intensity, the building was not supposed to fall or be damaged. It is a big problem that older homes are not able to adhere to new safety standard. However, does the government know which homes are in danger? Which areas are likely to liquefy? Which homes should be checked out and improved? I think honestly, the government does not have these numbers. Thus, government subsidies were given to owners of older homes to check on their building condition. It was left up to the experts to determine how safe the buildings were. Health checks on old homes were inexpensive, yet cost-effective. It strongly benefits externality, especially in terms of public safety. Whether it is a CSAM building or internal structural damage, experts are able to properly diagnose the problem. After evaluation, portions of the housing units would need to undergo seismic strengthening. Who should be paying for this cost actually needs further consideration.
With that said, a building's seismic intensity or soil liquefaction probability is difficult to evaluate with the diagnosis alone. However, improving old homes perhaps can provide a better solution. Through this earthquake simulation, one can see that while the traditional structure is rocking drastically from side to side, with a damper in place, the structure's movements are reduced. Including sliding and rolling, the damper isolates the movement and reduces the seismic loading by about 60 to 70 percent. This type of safety measure is actually already used in modern structures. However, as dampers are expensive and placement of it need to be factored into the original housing design, scholars say frankly it is difficult to incorporate this technique into home remodeling. To properly cope with the problem, improvements to old buildings is only the first step. In the future, the results of home inspection must be tabulated for reference purpose when designing development policy. A proper strategy must also develop to deal with homes that fail the inspection. Some past award winners of the Outstanding Women in Buddhism have included Master Jinyin and Venerable Master Shou Yi, the abbess of Miaochuan Temple. Let's take a look at how they integrated spiritual practice into daily living. Having promoted moral education in schools, prisons, and among the general public for more than 20 years, Venerable Master Xiu Yi remembers one person the most. I remember one death row inmate who attended my class for a year and said, My only regret is that during my 30 years of life, I did not come across Buddhist teachings. His words struck me, and I thought as preachers of religion, we haven't done enough. Working to lessen problems in society, Venerable Master Xiu Yi, who heads the Miaochen Temple in Nantou, believes that monasteries is more than cultivation grounds for the monastics, but for all people. Working amongst the public has won her the honor of the third Outstanding Woman in Buddhism Awards. Receiving the award made the Master realize that she was not alone on the path of compassion. The strength of many people has been gathered, proving that we are not alone. Such strength broadens and brightens our lives. Brought together by the award, the contributing Dharma masters and lay Buddhist practitioners inspire and learn from each other, which includes Master Zheng Yin, the founder of Ziji Foundation, who was also honored during the first Outstanding Woman in Buddhism Awards. At the first award ceremony, Master Zheng Yin was honored for bringing the essence of humanistic Buddhism into practice and promoting the Buddha's wisdom. Now, in its 15th year, the words have recognized Buddhist women who do not just cultivate themselves, but have also contributed in the fields of charity, culture, education, or society at large. It's a good example. It's, we, we have power. Uh, to do good thing more. Though they each promote Buddhist teachings in different parts of the world, the award winners share the same ultimate goal of working for Buddhism and the benefit of mankind. 
As we previously reported, Suji has built 182 schools in 16 countries, so the marginalized have a chance to reverse their fortune through an education. We now visit the very first of the Suji schools built overseas and find out what the school means to the locals. Among a group of students visiting the Jinsi abode in Hualien, Liu Zida stands out due to his definitive facial feature. An English major at the Cixi University, he hails from Chiang Mai, Thailand, and was among the first graduating class of the local Cixi school. The years I spent at the Cixi school really changed me, especially my temper. My mother often said that I was really stubborn. Thanks to my teacher, I slowly changed my bad temper and habit. He said that if I don't change, I will have trouble making friends in the future. In 2005, the first Cixi school overseas, the Chiang Mai Cixi School, was inaugurated, allowing students in this remote part of Thailand to study Chinese, get an education, and develop life skills. It all started back in 1994, when the Overseas Community Affairs Council suddenly lost its funding to support remnants of the Nationalist Army from the Chinese Civil War in northern Thailand. Thus, the minister came to Ziji for help. The budget was limited and would run out soon. I was really worried and didn't know what to do as our work was not done. Then, I thought only Master Zheng Yan could help. So I came to meet with the master, who said yes immediately. Beginning in 1995, Cixi volunteers began visiting all settlements in the region and witnessed the lack of educational resources and the vicious cycle of poverty that plagued the people here. Thus, a plan to build a school was drawn up. In school, Satanan Kansiri, who is from northeastern Thailand, studies hard so her mom doesn't have to worry. My mom works very hard so I can go to school. How should I put this? I, I, I don't want to let my mom's effort go to waste. It has been us living together. I'm always eager to share my life with her. To go home means more than 10 hours of a bus ride for Satana. Once home, she goes to the night market to peddle goods with her mother. This is the only source of income for this poor single parent family. I told her, I'm really in a bind lately. I said, perhaps you can go talk with your school and see if you can make payments or get an extension. That way you can continue your schooling. The school's understanding has put the mother and daughter pair at ease, for it understands why these parents go above and beyond to put their children through school. The Sankarang Ziji School in Indonesia was also built to help young minds inch towards their dreams. At this graduation, graduates perform the musical adaptation of the Sutra of Profound Gratitude to Parents, which deeply resonates with Ajahn. I was spoiled before and often rebelled against my parents. Whatever they wanted me to do, I will always make an excuse not to do it. But I have changed recently. Whatever they ask me to do now, I'll do them immediately. I'm working on improving myself. Before, she was more stubborn and also temperamental. She is now much better and more obedient. We parents don't want much. We just hope that she will be smart and filial. After people who used to live by the banks of Anke River relocated here, the school that takes in students from kindergarten all the way through high school has been providing their children with wholesome education while instilling proper values. When you give children a goal and teach them how to reach it, they will develop hope. With hope, they will gain willpower, which will help them cope with setbacks. They then learn how to troubleshoot and overcome these obstacles. I think education is about giving children the wings to fly. With education, any place troubled by poverty or war can have a chance at a better future.
21-year-old Johnson Wong from Malacca, Malaysia, has had trouble learning since young. However, things changed when he began to practice environmental conservation at his local recycling station with his family. It was there that he gained the confidence he needed in life. 21-year-old Johnson Wong is moving the recyclables around with agility. No one can tell he has learning disabilities. When I was little, I couldn't do many things. I couldn't read or write. The doctor said he was fine, but he just couldn't master anything. Even now, he has the intelligence of a fifth or sixth grader. He is diligent and he does his job well. His family had been worrying about his condition since he was little. When he was 16 years old, he followed his mother and sister to a Tsuji recycling station. After he came here, we made him work with other people so we could feel more at ease. Johnson has learning disabilities, but he is very good at recycling. He now goes to two separate recycling stations three days a week, and he has been doing it for five years. He has gained much confidence by doing it. At the beginning, Sister Ang Siu Kim taught me how to separate the plastics, so I simply learned and did it. You had to demonstrate to him how to do certain work. Just teach him one to two times, and he'd master it. After he started coming here, he has been giving us a lot of help. If you call him, he'll come to you. He never ignores your call. Johnson's mother is comforted to see how recycling has improved her son's growth. I really want to thank Ziji, as the group gives him great help. He now talks to other people about recycling. When he sees recyclables, he'll pick them up. I'm young, and young people have strength, so I can offer help. With lessons learned from the recycling station, the slow angel has learned to protect the environment and grow in his own way. Next, we meet a Tsuji Care recipient in Taiwan whose life has been turned around thanks to Tsuji volunteers' love and assistance. Back then, I had no money, and I didn't want to live anymore. Mr. Liu is the one holding a coin bank on the stage. He was once an electrician in Pingdong. However, after he underwent a surgery for his oral cancer, his life was shattered. Tsuji volunteers heard about it and came to help him. The volunteers often came and cared about my condition. They made me realize there was love in the world, so I stopped feeling pessimistic. Change of attitude changes life. The volunteers' encouragement brought hope to Mr. Liu. At this reunion feast, he donates his cactus and handicraft to support Ziji. He said he wanted to make a model of the Jingsi Hall and of the abode, so I wanted to show him pictures. He said it wasn't necessary, he could use the computer to find them. Then he finished them. These delicate models were created with bamboo strips by Mr. Liu. Now he has joined the rank of recycling volunteers and found a new purpose in life. In China's Dongguan, 93-year-old Deng Qunghao, who lives in a senior home, thoroughly enjoys the visits Siji volunteers pay her each month. We will leave you with these images at the end of the program. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.